Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining me. This is GGF bringing you episode four of Let's Try Pathfinder, Wrath of the Righteous. Got my manatee buddy here again. I think it's a manatee. I'm not sure. Hope you guys are well. We are still checking out character creation as this is a massive game. And uh, <clears throat> we're going to be playing on core difficulty eventually. Who knows? Maybe we'll get a character made today. I really don't know, but just picking a temporary portrait and back to the class selection screen. <gasps> Ooh, excuse me. Back to the class selection screen. So I really have no idea what I'd like to make. Um, there's so many cool sounding classes. Archaeologist still speaks to me, but like I said, we played the first Kingmaker game as an archaeologist. Blood Rager is a little too wild. Cavalier has an animal companion. Strong melee fighters who can empower allies. Um, check out the clerics. Uh, Crusaders. Demon Bane Priest. Um, Druids are interesting. Um, Like, I don't know what to expect from the game, so it's just sort of like, we're just gonna wing it. Hunters get an animal companion, teamwork feats, and an animal aspect. And then... Urban Hunter's pretty cool. Probably not going to be a kineticist. Probably not going to be a magus. Although Arcane Rider is so cool. Gets an annual animal companion, Arcane Mount. That is wild. But maguses are very hard to use. There's a lot of micromanagement. And there's even armored battle mage, dude. Um, learn to move and cast spells in even the most restrictive armors and develop new methods to magically enhance their armor. Magus proficiencies are martial weapons, simple weapons, light armor, and then medium armor. Added by the archetype arcane pool. An armored battle mage cannot spend points from his arcane pool to enhance weapons. Instead, he can expend one point from his pool as a swift action to grant armor. He's wearing a plus one enhancement bonus for one minute. For every four magus levels he has beyond the first, the armor gains another plus one enhancement bonus to a max of plus five at 17th level. These bonuses stack with existing armor enhancement bonuses to a max of plus five. Multiple uses of this ability do not stack. Hmm. Oh, at fifth level, the bonuses can be used to add any of the following armor special abilities. Balanced, bitter, fortification, heavy, light, or medium, ghost touch, and vulnerability, spell resist, or spell storing. Adding those special abilities consumes an amount of bonus equal to the ability's base price modifier. In addition, the Armored Battle Mage can grant his armor the Energy Resistance Special Ability at the cost of a plus 3 bonus, or the Improved Energy Resistance Special Ability at the cost of a plus 5 bonus. These Special Abilities are added to any of the, any of the armor already has, but duplicates do not stack. If the armor is not magical, at least a plus 1 Enhancement bonus must be added before any other Special Abilities can be added. Hmm. And then, 
you know, they lose an arcane pool or just the way the arcane pool used used to work. Spell combat is they lost, I guess. Hmm. Spell strike, then they get armor training. Gains armor training as per the fighter ability. Wow. Loses Magus Arcana. Spell recall. Arcane armor plus two. Rather than arcane weapon plus two. Heavy armor at level seven. Oh my gosh. Armor training. Fighter training at level 10. Wow. So pretty cool. You know, they can use this heavy armor. They use persuasion. They use knowledge of the world and arcana. Oh, these things, these guys carry the black blade, a sentient weapon of unknown and possibly unknowable purpose. Black blade. How crazy is that? At first level, the blade bound Magus gains a powerful sentient scimitar called a black blade and can communicate with it telepathically. As a swift action, the Magus can manifest the black blade in his hand. Gains a plus one at fifth level and every four levels thereafter for max plus five at 17th level. And who knows what that entails because can talk telepathically to it. Sharpening the Black Blade. At third level, as a free action, the Blade Bound Magus can spend one point from his arcane pool to grant the Black Blade a plus one bonus on damage rolls for one minute. And then for every three levels beyond third, gives the Black Blade another plus one bonus on damage rolls. Changeable Gist, or Gist. At fifth level, as a free action, the Blade Bound Magus can spend one point from his pool to change the type of all damage dealt by him using the Black Blade or damage dealt by the Black Blade by itself to one of the following types, cold, electricity, or fire. He can spend two points from his arcane pool to change that damage type to sonic or force, and it lasts until the start of the Magus's next turn. So that's cool. I mean, using a Black Blade and stuff, it gets Life Drinker and all sorts of stuff. Um... Elder Scion is pretty cool. Unlike typical magi, they don't study tomes of magic or spend time learning to combine martial and magical skills. It all comes to them instinctively. How wicked is that? So they get a bloodline. They have a source of magic somewhere in their heritage that grants them spells, bonus feats, an additional class skill, and other special abilities. This source can represent a blood relation or an extreme event involving a creature somewhere in the family's past. For example, an eldritch scion might have a dragon as a distant relative, or her grandfather might have signed a terrible contract with the devil. Regardless of the source, this influence manifests in a number of ways as the eldritch scion gains levels. An eldritch scion must pick one bloodline upon taking her first level of eldritch scion. Once made, the choice cannot be changed. Wow. And then Eldritch Pool, Cantrips. Hmm. Spell Dancer it has to be an elf. They believe their ability to cast spells while fighting is an outgrowth of the concept of the spell dance, which is just another kind of wizardry. Sword Saint. I has to pick a chosen weapon. These oracles are really interesting too. I just wish they had some melee. For that, we'd have to go to like Paladin. Ranger. Demon Slayer is pretty basic, but cool. 
get to rogues, Sylvan Trickster. They mold themselves after the mischievous Fey of Legend. They're not spellcasters, but they learn minor magic abilities reminiscent of those favored by Fey creatures. get fey tricks can select a witch hex in place of a rogue talent at 10th level the sylvan trickster can select a hex or a major hex in place of a rogue talent at 18th level a trickster can select a hex major hex or grand hex in place of a rogue talent but she cannot select any hex more than once this alters rogue talents everything else is pretty much the same until level four resist nature's lure a druid gains a, well, the trickster gains a plus four bonus on saving throws against the spell-like and supernatural abilities of fays and plants. More fey tricks. Loses uncanny dodge and rogue talent. More fey tricks at level six and level eight and then fey resistance. At fifth level, a sylvan trickster gains damage reduction to cold iron. At 11th level and every three levels thereafter, the damage reduction increases by two to a maximum of DR10, Cold Iron. Wow. Major Hexes, Fey Resistance, so. Interesting. We haven't really seen what the Fey tricks are, but I'm sure they're very cool. Uh, Master of All, Half Elf. Let's see what the Master of All looks like as a half-elf. Bardic Knowledge. A bard, well, the Master of All adds his class level minimum one to all knowledge and lore skill checks and may make all knowledge and lore skill checks untrained. Hmm. Everything stays the same till they get a skill focus at level three instead of a sneak attack. At third level and every six levels thereafter, a Master of All gains the skill focus feat. And then we head up, getting sneak attacks, rogue talents, get another skill focus at level 9 instead of a sneak attack. Rogue talents, sneak attack, skill focus, same idea. Interesting. Oh, gaining new knowledge and skills. Yeah, that makes sense. So all of these skills they can potentially, you know, become masters of. That's interesting because... I love being able to pass these skill checks and stuff. And I love playing half elves. We could get into, let's say, persuasion, um, perception. Um, one sec, guys, my volume's a little low. Use magic device. Um, knowledge arcana. So we can really... Well, no. Not as a rogue. You're not going to get much knowledge arcana, but... Trap finding weapon finesse. Rogue proficiency. Sneak attack. Evasion. Danger sense. So... Pretty much the basics of rogue. Eldritch scoundrel. Rare breed of adventure, most commonly found seeking lost and valuable arcane writings in the ruins of fallen empires. Very cool. We looked at these last episode. They do get rapier skills, short sword, and short bow. Cantrips, they can scribe scrolls. But level four, they lose both the rogue talent and uncanny dodge, and the sneak attacks go away. Well, one does. And they lose a lot, whereas they're not gaining a lot, it looks like. What have they gained? Pretty much cantrips. And I don't see any time... You know, where they would learn more. And they're not proficient with any armor or shields. Hmm... Sorry if my mic keeps brushing against. I, I wear my mic pretty low. Dark Lurker's interesting. They add shadow 
Dark Lurkers known as the Hungry Knight, or they add Darkness as their ally. Blade from the Shadows gains the ability at second level to travel between shadows and deliver sudden strikes to victims. While within five feet of a larger creature, as a standard action, the Dark Lurker can step into the creature's shadow and emerge from the shadow of an enemy larger than the Dark Lurker within 30 feet, then make a single sneak attack with a melee weapon against that enemy. At night time, the Dark Lurker gains a plus two circumstance bonus on this attack. Hmm. Blind fight. The Dark Lurker gains blind fight as a bonus feat without having to meet the prerequisites. Rogue talent. Can take evasion as a rogue talent. Improved blind fight. Greater blind fight. Hmm. Let's keep looking. Shamans. Did you hexes? I wish they had some melee. Well, they do have some melee, actually. Shamans, no kidding. This is interesting. They have a lot of support. Good amount of magic. They're pretty decent at melee. A shaman, really? Hmm. Could be a half-orc wildland shaman. Which doctor's a sort of healer. But it's all tribal peeps, too, which I'm not really thinking my background's going to be tribal. Shifter has all the melee. Scald. Singer, Slayer. Sorcerer War Priest. Use cold weapons and a vast array of sacred spells. Witches, Wizard. Shadowcaster, Spellmaster, Thessalonian Specialist. Hmm. I have no clue what to be, guys. I tend to keep... I tend to think, like, of, in basic terms, like... Make a basic nomad or rogue or something, but... Expert Demon Slayer. They get Stigmata. As a standard action, the martyr can chant hymns of faith and cause bleeding Stigmata to visibly appear on his body. At 7th level, he can manifest Stigmata as a move action. 13th level, he can do so as a swift action. He can use this ability a number of rounds per day equal to 4 plus his Charisma modifier. At 1st level, plus 1 additional round per day for each level beyond 1st. While his Stigmata are active, he takes 1 point of bleed damage, which automatically ceases when he ends the ability but otherwise does not relent, even in the face of magical healing or heal checks. His Stigmata assist his allies, duplicating... Inspire Courage, Bardic Performance of a Bard of his Paladin level. At 10th level, he can choose to duplicate the effects of Inspire Greatness. At 16th level, he can choose to duplicate the effects of Inspire Heroics. So a bit, 
bit of a bard thing. He can inspire perform uh, courage. I guess that's what the stigmata does, right? Yeah. So he can inspire courage. He can't smite evil. Oh. But he gets see no evil, hear no evil. At second level, the martyr and all allies within 20 feet of him gain a plus four morale bonus on saving throws against sonic and gaze attacks. It only functions when the martyr is conscious, but he loses divine grace. And then gains a bunch of this stuff. The Martyr's Aura of Courage, Aura of Resolve, and Aura of Righteousness have a radius of 20 feet instead of 10, but the Martyr does not gain immunity to fear, charms, or compulsions from those abilities. Huh. Aura of Health, Martyr's Mercy. At third level, a Martyr can apply any of the mercies for which he qualifies based on his Paladin level to his Lay on Hands. Even if he didn't select that mercy or its prerequisites. However, when he uses a mercy he didn't select, he loses his aura of health or see no evil, hear no evil aura. Depending on the mercy for one round, as long as the martyr's aura is disabled, he cannot apply corresponding mercies. The martyr can use lay on hands on any ally within short range rather than needing to touch the ally. That's pretty cool. I don't know what those mercy things are. Aura Mastery, 20 feet instead of 10. Aura of Health is plus 4 within 20 feet. Morale bonus on saving throws against diseases. <laughs> Aura of Courage. Paladin's immune to fear, magical or otherwise, and each ally within 10 feet, which goes to 20. Gets a plus 4 morale bonus on saving throws against fear effects. Loses Divine Health and... The old aura of courage, mercy. Each mercy adds an effect to the paladin's lay on hands ability. Whenever the paladin uses lay on hands to heal damage to one target, the target also receives the additional effects from all of the mercies possessed by the paladin. Makes sense, but again, he loses smite evil. He can channel positive energy. Higher inspire courage, divine bond, mercy. Bardic performance move action. Okay. So he can use the stick mod as a move action, which means he can still attack in the same round as a standard action or do whatever he wants. Loses all smite evil aura of resolve. The paladin is immune to charm spells and spell like abilities and each ally within 10 feet gains plus four morale bonus on saving throws against charm effects. Loses this aura of resolve, which I don't understand. Maybe, I don't know. Mercy, Inspire Greatness, Inspire Courage, Bardic Performance. So, basically, he inspires a lot with his Stigmata. Tending to the Sick, Divine Scion. Not only do they get Battle Prowess through Faith, but also through Knowledge. They get a Study Target. A character can study an opponent he can see as a move action. They then gain a plus one bonus on weapon attack and damage rolls against it. And the save DCs of character class abilities against that opponent increase by one. If a character deals sneak attack damage to a target, he studies that target, allowing him to apply his study target bonuses against that target, including to the normal weapon damage roll. And at 5th, 10th, 15th, and 20th, the bonuses on weapon attack rolls, damage rolls, and character save DCs against a study target increase by one. And at 7th level, you can study opponent as a move or swift action. But doesn't, but loses smite evil. And... Oh wow, they get sneak attack, no kidding. Divine insight, you gain an insight bonus at 5th level equal to your charisma modifier on all lore and knowledge skill checks. Nice. You still get the mercy thing, you lose a divine bond. Which a divine bond is... Uh, at 5th level, a paladin forms a divine bond with her god. The bond can take one of two forms. Once the form is chosen, it can't be changed. 
The first type allows a paladin to form a divine bond with her weapon. As a standard action, she can call upon the aid of celestial spirits for one minute per paladin level. At fifth level, the spirit grants the weapon plus one enhancement bonus. For every three levels beyond fifth, the weapon gains another plus one to a max of plus six at 20th level. These bonuses can be added to the weapon, stacking with existing weapon bonuses to a max of plus five. Alternatively, they can be used to add any of the following weapon properties. Axiomatic, Brilliant Energy. Oh good, we can check it. An axiomatic weapon is infused with lawful power. It makes the weapon law aligned and thus bypasses the corresponding damage reduction. Deals an extra 2d6 points of damage against Chaotic. Anyway, it adds all that. Um, but we're losing that, so I'm not going to get into that right now. Unless we choose something that has it. So you lose that, the Divine Bond. Gain more study target, lose smite evil, more sneak attack at level 10. Um, loses a mark of justice, whatever that is. Okay, so it's a divine scion, they gain knowledge as well as faith. Does not gain access to divine spellcasting. But she gets guarding hands, paladin can heal wounds, those of her own or of others by touch. Each day she can use this ability a number of times equal to half her Paladin level plus Charisma mod. With one use of this ability, Paladin can heal 1d6 points of damage for every two Paladin levels. Using this ability as a standard action, unless the Paladin targets herself or her Divine Troth, in which case it's a swift action. Despite the name of this ability, a Paladin only needs one free hand to use this ability. You can also use it to deal damage to Undead, Divine Touch. Pledges her protection to a willing creature for the day. The creature gains benefits while remaining adjacent to the Divine Guardian. When a target of the Divine Guardian's Divine Troth ability is attacked, if that target is within her melee reach, she may use an attack of opportunity to provide her ally with a plus four bonus to AC. The Divine Guardian can intercept a successful attack against the target of her Divine Troth ability once per round. Wow. Taking full damage from that attack and any associated effects. That's a full out bodyguard for any character that we decide to roll with. Like as a companion, we can pick a weaker companion and just completely protect her. While also doing our own thing with damage and stuff. And Wow, so many cool things. She does gain Smite Evil. Which is good. Proficiencies with light, medium, heavy armor, simple martial and shield. Wow. Hmm. That is interesting. Let's see what else um, stands out to us. Underground chemist can brew potions. Knife master, sneak stab. Eldritch scoundrel, yeah. Um, hmm. War Priest gains fervor. This ability allows the War Priest to cast any spell very quickly, but only on themselves. Also allows the War Priest to heal themselves or their allies with a touch or to damage the undead. War priests choose a deity to worship. Each deity grants a number of blessings to give unique abilities. War priests can choose two of them, and they get sacred weapons. War priest chooses one weapon type from the many available and perfects the art of using it. As they progress, it deals more damage and can be empowered with various spells and ability abilities. War priests also gain bonus feats that give them bonus to attack and damage rolls available only to them. Prerequisites: they can't be an atheist. Four star difficulty, but man, they really tick a lot of the boxes. Champion of the Faith. 
Champions of the faith are crusaders who use the power of their divine patron to annihilate the faith's enemies. Um, Disenchanter, dangerous to the mind and the soul. Disenchanter seeks to keep the powers of magic in check. Feral champion, I'm... It's like a shapeshifter. Evoke animalistic power and fury. Mantis Zealot does not bode well for both offenders and innocents, for his true goals are known only to his deity. Doesn't have a deity selection for some reason. But gains a weapon proficiency with a sawtooth saber. Oh. Guys, I can't wait to play the game, but I still don't want to rush. If you know what I mean, like I still want to pick, make sure I make a good character because we're going to be playing this for hundreds of hours. It's only right that we have a good main character that we can relate to. Shield bearer. And honestly, like I said, I have no idea. I'm trying to think and use these episodes to kind of just go over different things we could be and try to think out loud like about my ideas of what we're going to be Leyline Guardian a witch who can harness the latent powers of ley lines to cast their magic uh, like war priests sorcerers have no melee but some ranged Nine-tailed air. Huh. They get a bloodline. Chooses a sorcerer's bloodline as usual, but she'll not learn any additional spells derived from her bloodline. At seventh level and every six levels thereafter, a nine-tailed air receives one bonus feat chosen from a list specific to each bloodline. And the heir must meet the prerequisites for these bonus feats. Gains a magical tail at level 2. Third level and every two levels thereafter, a nine-tailed heir gains magical tail as a bonus feat. Oh, that's how they get their nine tails. If the nine-tailed heir already has nine tails, each additional time the feat is taken, the sorcerer gains one additional daily use of the lowest level magical tail ability, not already affected by the spell. So they keep gaining tails every level. Oh my gosh. And something happens with those like Geomancer can cut themselves to use magic. Cross-blooded. Gonna hit my water bottle, guys. Sylvan Sorcerer. Um, Paladin's kind of sticking out. Magus still is sticking out. Um, Eldritch Scion. Bladebound. Oh, Armored Battle Major. Arcane Rider. Inquisitors? I don't know. Faith Hunters like. Judges, Living Grimoire, Monster Tactician. Sacred Hunts Master is pretty cool. Sanctified Slayer. These guys are usually pretty, pretty intense. Hunters with a loyal friend, Divine Hound. What about just being a hunt? Well, Fighter's only one star, but it does have some cool stuff like Titan Fighter, an Aldori Defender. Trude's interesting.
Do they have any melee? Not really. They don't get much attack bonus either. Hmm. Cleric. A shoe's physical armor for protection via the strength of its faith. Separatist, Angel Fire Apostle. Use the powers of good to avoid violence when possible and cleanse both melodies and evil creatures with blinding flames. Sounds pretty interesting. They can channel energy. They get an extra channel. They have diminished spell casting, less concerned with the traditional divine magic that many religious adherents receive. The apostle receives one fewer spell slot at each spell level. When an angel fire apostle gets no spells per day at a spell level, he can cast domain spells of that level normally, but can only cast non-domain spells of that level if he gets them as bonus spells. Gets an armor proficiency in light armor, simple weapons, and shield proficiency. They're only proficient with light armor. So they lose, you know, medium armor and shields. Oh no, they get shield proficiency. They lose media armor, medium armor. They lose another channel energy. They get domains, versatile healing channel. At fifth level, the apostle can spend two uses of his channel energy ability to cast remove blindness or restoration. Lesser as a spell like ability. At seventh level, you can do remove disease and remove paralysis. Ninth level, neutralize poison. 11th level breath of life, 13th level heal, 17th restoration, 19th resurrection. Pretty cool, and that goes up each turn. And then the bonus. Oh, I thought the attack bonus went up more, but um. Yeah, it keeps getting that as time goes on. But they only have like persuasion, a couple knowledge skills, lore religion. And the clerics gain, they can channel energy, they gain domains, and they have spontaneous spells. Blood Rager are berserkers, they're a little intense. What about bards? Well, cavaliers, knight of the wall, phantasmal steeds. I mean, the ones on steeds are admittedly really cool. What if we. Guys, I think I have an idea. I think an idea just came to me. Where are they? Where are they? Wait, wasn't there an arcane rider? What class was that? I could have sworn there was an arcane rider. It was a Magus, and these are five star difficulties. But check this out I can picture myself on a steed fighting. When a Magus gains a special bond with his mount, he becomes an arcane rider. The Magus and his faithful companion not only begin to think as one, but literally become a single arcane entity. They share one arcane pool and can move through dimensions together, plunging enemies into confusion with sudden attacks from nowhere. Sounds awesome. And we're 39 minutes in. Oh my gosh. So guys, I think this might be the one. Um, let's look at Magus as a whole. They get spell combat. This ability allows the Magus to cast a spell within the same round as a weapon attack. If can't be used if the Magus has their have both hands full. Spell Strike can charge a weapon with a spell that requires a touch attack and then deliver it by attacking the enemy with that weapon. Very cool. Arcane Pool. Magus possess a pool of arcane energy that allows them to empower their weapons 
Restore spent spells and use other special abilities. Five star, of course, and it's an arcane spellcaster who fights with a weapon in one hand and spell in the other. This would be very cool. Arcane Rider. So they get Animal Companion. Um, in the sense of like it's a druid having one. Most animal companions increase in size when the druid reaches 4th or 7th level, the magus in this case. And unlike normal animals of its kind, an animal companion's hit dice, abilities, skills, and feats advances the magus advances its in level. Arcane Mount. An arcane rider's abilities that spend arcane pool also apply to his mount companion. He gets bonus feats, may select mounted combat feats as bonus feats. Arcane Pool, Spell Combat, Magus Proficiencies, Light Armor, Simple and Martial Weapons, Cantrips, Spell Strikes, Magus Arcana, Learns Arcane Secrets, tailored to his specific way of blending martial, puissance, and magical skill. Starting at third level, Magus gains one Magus Arcana. He gains an additional Magus Arcana for every three levels of Magus attained after third. Unless specifically noted in a Magus Arcana's description, a Magus cannot select a particular Magus Arcana more than once. Loses Spell Recall, so we won't worry about that. Gains another Magus bonus feat at level 5. Nice. Arcane Weapon plus 2. Awesome. We lose Arcane Medium Armor, but we gain Dimensional Ride at level 8. Can spend one point from the pool and a move action to transfer himself and his mount companion from his current location to any spot, any other spot within a 30 foot range. That is nuts. And improve spell combat. Yeah, I think this is what we're going to be, guys. They get fighter training at level 10. I think we're going to be an arcane rider. I'm going to try my hand at the Magus. Um and try to not muck it up too bad. I mean, there's some cool Maguses all around. You can be a sword saint. Spent focusing training and meditation into a rapturous perfection of the use of a single weapon, which is usually but not always a sword. There's Armored Battle Mage where we can get medium and heavy armor. And even they have the black blade. The Magnuses are just very cool to me. But anyway, I think we're going to be an arcane rider, guys. So I think we figured that much out. Next time we'll figure out race and continue. Um, sorry if you guys want to see like gameplay already. This is episode four and we haven't gotten even close to that. But, you know, this is what I've undertaken. <laughs> this is a massive game that requires a lot of paying attention, a lot of text. So that's just how it's got to be. So I hope you guys don't mind. Hope you're enjoying it. Thank you for watching. If you are enjoying it, guys, please go ahead and hit the like button or leave a comment. That lets me know that you are enjoying it and you'd like to see more. And then more will inevitably get made. I'd like to make more for all the other games I start on the channel. Like, those really interest me too. But eh, you can only play one thing at a time and can only, you know, spend so much time gaming. So... It is what it is, guys. I'll try to return to them over time, add an episode here or there, and that sort of thing. But I do apologize about that if you want to see more of those. Anyway, they're not closed. No LP or LT on my channel is ever closed. It's always open. So eventually, if you ask uh, me to make more, I will make more episodes of that particular game. So feel free to command me in the comments. And if you're new here, guys, well, welcome. I hope you enjoyed, and I invite you to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any uploads. That said, guys, look at all these races. I hope you'll join me next time as we go to pick a, uh, a race and beyond. So we'll head out back for now. Until next time, guys, be well, live well, stay well, and do come back. We haven't even scratched the surface of this behemoth yet, as you most likely are very well aware of. 
Anyway, guys, until next time, much love, peace, and joy from me to you. See you guys then. Bye-bye.